going to speak about hollowness or opening, poetic language in the philosophy of Weda and Heidegger. Adam is uh, teaching in the University of Cork, uh, philosophy, Japanese philosophy, or philosophy as such, <laughs> and is now doing some research on Weda for a forthcoming book. All right, so I'm going to talk about a lot of the same things um, that were just spoken of here. You'll see some of the same quotes, actually. But uh, as you see, I'm uh, putting Heidegger and Ueda in dialogue. And because I'm going to be going back and forth, I actually have the quotes up here. So hopefully that will help us all uh, follow along. So both, both Ueda and Heidegger feel that there's a danger in the representational use of language. Both offer a theory of poetic language as a means of averting this danger and focus on the work of several poets as pointing the way to a less destructive use of language and thus a better way of being in the world. Heidegger is well known for invoking many German poets in this respect. Uh, poets such as Rilke, Hildelin, and Stefan Georg. Ueda uh, also engages famous poets, in, including Rilke, uh, but in the writings of his I would like to focus on today, that's language in a twofold world, Oeda's poet, poet exemplar is much more humble. He takes quite seriously a short poem written by an unnamed Japanese boy who submitted a poem to his local newspaper, which is the one that we already saw. Um, in this paper, I place Ueda and Heidegger in dialogue, comparing the ways in which they construe the dangers of language and how they propose to avert that danger through poetic language. What I propose is that for both, this language finds a way to speak of things in the world as neither fully negated nor asserted, neither as an object nor a non-object. Uh, I end with a brief proposition that the unnamed boy, the unnamed poet, might succeed to a greater extent in enacting the type of poetic language that both, uh, uh, the type of poetic language uh, than the famous poets who are Heidegger's exemplars. So these correspond actually in the translation I'm working with. Uh, so I think um, you used so uh, unreal and real. So uh, kyo no kotoba, I use a translation that has this as hollowness. And jitsu no kotoba, uh, actuality. Sorry, I took this no, no. German word. Yeah, no, that's fine. This is just the one, uh, what I'm using. So, so you know that those kind of line up with the terms that Yukiko is using. So uh, in his essay, Language in a Twofold World, Ueda alludes to the danger inherent to abuses of language in the media. He diagnoses this danger in terms of the relation between what he calls hollowness, kyo no kotoba, and actuality, jitsu no kotoba. He says, quote, um, when a balance of actuality and hollowness has not been established as the rule, uh, dangers arise for human existence. Ueda's poet, we will see, averts this danger by striking the proper balance between hollowness and actuality through a poetic use of language. So the proper balance that he's looking for uh, is he, he wants that we can play in hollowness while abiding in actuality, while the inverse, toying with actuality while abiding in hollowness, is a danger that he believes we must avoid. So let's look at Heidegger for a minute. So Heidegger also turns to poetic language because of a danger he believes threatens humanity. Following Hölderlin, Heidegger characterized his time as a destitute, as the world's midnight, where the united three classical gods, Heraclitus, Dionysus, and Christ, have all retreated in the age defined by their absence. This absence, or uh, abgrund, must be endured, Heidegger believes. Those who have the saving power in the destitute time are the poets who can endure this absence, of ground without abdicating language, but finding a way to sing within the groundlessness. In his essay, What Are Poets For?, he gives a rather straightforward articulation of the danger as it relates to representational language. So he says, it is by positioning that belongs to representation that nature is brought before man. Man places before himself <clears throat> the world as the whole of everything objective, and he places himself before the world. Man sets up the world towards himself and delivers nature over to himself. And where nature is not satisfactory to man's representation, he reframes and redisposes it. To treat the world as though it conforms to the expectations of the representational model is to treat the world and things in it as objects. Heidegger says quite clearly, 
in uh, what are poets for, we must never represent this sphere of being and its sphericity as an object. So this is where the danger lies for Heidegger. If there's no way to see or to speak of the world other than within the representational constraints, he says that this places man outside of all <coughs> care and protection. The imposition of the objectifying of the world destroys ever more resolutely the very possibility of protection. So poetic language is an orientation within language meant to overcome these dangers, in part by going beyond uh, the thing concept of the object. For Heidegger, uh, the poet, he says, quote, his, the poet's song turns our unprotected being into the open. And the open can be understood within uh, his wider project of overcoming Western metaphysics and this destructive thing concept. The open is a realm where subject-object language cannot describe entities. Uh, representation is thus inappropriate for describing the open. And the poet is the one who is venturesome enough to risk language when the open has not yet been positively disclosed, uh, when exactly what things are remains undetermined, and the poet sings without needing to reinstate metaphysical grounds. So turning now to Ueda, we can find some pre preliminary similarities between Heidegger's open uh, and Ueda's idea of hollowness, or kyo no kotoba. So one of the main commonalities between Ueda's and Heidegger's poet is that both propose going beyond the object and representational language uh, by going beyond the distinction between the visible and the invisible. Ueda's hollowness actuality concepts are indexed to visibility and inv invisibility, where actuality is visible and hollowness is invisible, insofar as what is hollow comes to presence within a field of non-objective non referentiality. To refer to this hollow, invisible aspect in language is much more complicated than it would be to refer to actuality. Uh, but this is what the poet risks. So now, to look at the poem again, this is the main, this is the line that Ueda focuses on here, the same one that Yukiko highlighted. So, carrying the day's events, the cloud drifts along. So, Ueda makes quite a big deal out of this particular line. Um, so we take this idea, carrying the day's events, as metaphorical, not as descriptive of the real world. The cloud isn't something that can literally carry, nor is a day something that can be carried. Yet it is thought that we construe experience as such for poetic effect. If we just said the cloud is big and white, or the day is rainy or sunny, this seems to be a more accurate representation. So while there is a reality that corresponds to such descriptions, it does not correspond exhaustively. To limit one's language to visible actuality is not to strive towards a more accurate description. It's actually to choose a circumscribed context for describing uh, an object or the world. And this is because Ueda believes that there's a twofoldness of the world that goes beyond the visible. Uh, so he says, Ueda says, because this is an invisible twofoldness, the invisible aspect of it is not sensed, and only what is visible and determined by language is taken to be the world. Then, where this visible and linguistically defined world is taken to be the one and only world, the human subject attempts to appropriate it as my world. And this is what gives rise to confrontations, conflicts, struggles, and distortions within the closed-off world. So it's very similar to what Heidegger says about representational language, and this is kind of the parallel that I want to draw that I think Ueda speaks of language that is limited to actuality along similar lines and the destructive aspects are similar. So there's a danger in limiting one's language and the conception of objects or one's own being to the visible or the actual. And there is, uh, beyond, an enveloping, beyond and enveloping the world of actuality, the world of hollowness, which is invisible, yet nevertheless counts within the visible and must be accounted for within our <coughs> use of language. Neither are typical ideas of objectivity nor are taken for granted words are appropriate. Ueda uh, proposes using hollow words in speaking of what he calls hollow things. So the hollow thing is not defined, defined in isolation from the world as a substance with an essence, but as empty of nature or essence or self-identity and constituted by its vast external relations. In short, negated objecthood as it is conceived of according to ideas of emptiness in Ueda's Mahayana-inspired Zen Buddhist tradition. So things are empty and also arise codependently as focuses in field of fields of relations. So we can see the Mahayana idea of uh, codependent origination or pratityat samuppada and how Ueda characterizes language. So 
He says, even as a system of signs, the nature of the system is to be a kind of whole that can never be completely surveyed. And at the same time, this whole is reflected in the mutual referentiality of its signs. Thus, language reveals phenomena within the world as reflecting the whole of the world. Moreover, language reveals this totality as something that cannot be completely surveyed and yet carries the sense of transcending the world. So whereas the object is fully visible and circumscribable insofar as it's abstracted from its referentiality that constitutes its world, the negated, or at least partially negated object, the hollow thing, is never fully visible because its relations proliferate out infinitely. It's not positively visible how a cloud carries a day. If we remain limited to actuality and to the visible, then the fourth line from the poem Ueda quotes reads uh, as an indulgence. Uh, so while there, while there are... Uh, sorry. Um, so how the cloud itself carries the poet... Sorry, let me back up. Um, so through the use of hollow words and poetic utterance, the hollow things are invoked as a greater totality of invisible relations focused on the visible object. While there are potentially infinite relations constituting any particular hollow thing, one of these relations, and indeed one of the most central, is how the cloud is related to the poet, him or herself. <coughs> how the cloud itself carries the poet who seeks to invoke it in language. So, uh, the cloud that drifts along is also in my world, uh, Ueda writes. I am among those events of the day. I too am inside the cloud and am included in its movements. End quote. So it's not simply that there is invisibility, but, but because the world that the hollow object brings forth overlaps with the world that the poet brings forth. So the poet's relation to an object, to a cloud, or to a day is part of that inv invisible context of relationality. So we tend to think of this type of language of carrying the day's events, the cloud drifts along, we tend to think of that as adding something extraneous to a perception of an object <coughs> that is originally fully visible and circumscribable. But I think it's actually the other way around. The metaphorical or hollow words are not in addition. It is the words of actuality that are subtraction from an encounter with an object that's always pregnant with a set of invisible relations, a world that sustains its being. So to speak poetically is a risk because poetic language straddles the visible and the invisible nature of the hollow object. To speak in actuality is to strip away from an object its worldliness to what is visible and be, can be represented. And this is the danger both Ueda and Heidegger diagnose. The stripping away of relationality characteristic of actuality or objecthood, the reduction of the invisible to the visible, is not only less accurate, it is also dangerous since it allows us to think of ourselves without any relation to the object. So the metaphorical is not an indulgence. It's actually, in a sense, more descriptive than literal or language that describes actuality as Ueda understands it because it takes up the challenge of describing an object in its worldliness and the poet accepts the risk of speaking of an object or a hollow thing in which her existence is intertwined. To use language as such is to speak from the point where one is mutually negated by the object in a metaphysical <coughs> and linguistic sense. While the poet can gear into the invisible relations between himself and the world and thus sing as a poet, there is nevertheless a further danger and abuse of abuses and indulgence made possible by uh, relation between hollow words and things. So what I'm trying to say there is that uh, even if a poet does find some way to speak uh, of the invisible relations, that Ueda wants to say that there's still actually a danger of poetic indulgence. Um, and that's to go back to the earlier slide that he says we should play in hollowness while abiding in actuality, but playing in actuality while abiding in, uh, in emptiness or hollowness is actually a danger. So before addressing that particular <coughs> aspect of Ueda's philosophy, I'd like to return to Heidegger quickly to see how he conceives of a similar turning to the invisible realm as a means of speaking uh, of the world in the idiom of poetic language. So and he makes this distinction between two forms of invisibility of consciousness and invisibility of the heart, which I think is relevant to how Ueda speaks of invisibility. 
So for Heidegger, the poet also has to go behind what is positively and objectively visible when speaking of the world in order to contravene the dangers of representational language. It might appear initially, however, that Heidegger goes counter to Ada because he associates the invisible with the threat of representational and self-assertive production. Yet, take note in this quote uh, um, that uh, he's speaking here specifically of the invisibility of consciousness. So he says, such representation knows nothing immediately perceptual. What can be immediately seen when we look at things, the image they offer to immediate sensible intuition falls away. The calculating production of technology is an act without an image. Purposeful self-assertion with its designs interposes before the intuitive image the project of the merely calculated product. When the world enters into the object, uh, objectness of the thought device product, it is placed within the non-sensible or the invisible. What stands thus owes its presence to a place whose activity belongs to the res cogitans, that is, to consciousness. So this is one form of invisibility, but this is the kind that uh, would not be related to Ueda's idea, but uh, the invisibility of the heart does. So as I said, this quote of Heidegger seems to deny Ueda's call for a language that evokes the invisible emptiness of the world, but this individual that invisibility of Heidegger's is the invisibility of the subject. It's the invisibility of the internal world that imposes its own desires in the external world. But the invisibility of consciousness is the invisibility one has to turn from for poetic utterance. So the solution is not a conversion from invisibility of consciousness uh, to the positively visible, but to what Heidegger calls the invisibility of the heart. Here, the space of the heart is ambiguous regarding self and world. Uh, so Heidegger says, the inner and invisible domain of the heart is not only more inward than the interior that belongs to calculating representation and therefore more invisible, it also extends further than does the realm of merely producible objects. And he continues, we turn the transient and therefore preliminary character of objects, uh, object things away from the inner and invisible region of the merely producing consciousness and towards the true interior of the heart space and there allow it to rise invisibly. So for Heidegger, there are two forms of invisibility. One overwhelms the object and demands it conforms to the desires of the subject. The other invisibility, the invisibility of the heart, uh, like Ueda's hollowness, demands a different and an expanded language. Hollow words that risk invoking the unseen bonds that, between self and world. <coughs> So the poet uses language that believes in the invisible and does not abstract objects out of their relations with the world, uh, but brings the world along in its invisible relationality through her enunciation. What, poet, what, what Heidegger calls the innermost, quote, the innermost and most invisible region uh, is not the restricted indivis in, invisibility of the subject, but what he calls, quote, the widest inner space of the world. And so he says, uh, the conversion points to the innermost region of the interior. The conversion of consciousness, therefore, is an inner recalling of the imminence of the object of representation <clears throat> into presence within the heart space. As long as man is wholly absorbed in nothing but purposeful self-assertion, not only is he himself unshielded, but so are things, because they have become objects. So alternatively, if one's actions conform to language that respects this invisibility, language that can speak of objects as part of the whole, of, a part of the heart space, then this interiority, so quoting Heidegger again here in the bottom, this interiority of the world's inner space unbars the open for us. Within this interior, we are free outside of the relation to the objects set around us that only seem to give protection. In the interiority of the world's inner space, there is a safety outside of all shielding. So to allow things to abide in the invisibility of the heart is to speak from within the open, as Heidegger advises, or, or I think similar to the idea that Heidegger, that Ueda says when, we, when he advises us to play in hollowness. Nevertheless, while a certain danger is averted by speaking as such, by going beyond objectivity, the object cannot be completely lost to the invisible referentiality that sustains its existence one must also remain in relation to actuality and poetic enunciation, lest one veers off into poetic indulgence. So, as Ueda puts it, as I've already said, 
we must play in hollowness while abiding in actuality, but the opposite, toying in actuality while abiding in hollowness is a further danger that we must avert. So I want to look at that idea and why we, Ueda advises us not to toy in actuality. So both Ueda and Heidegger are quite clear that there is a danger to representational language that abides in objectivity. But while they want to bring a non-objective type of language to the fore, the essential point that must be kept in mind is that neither endorses a complete lack of objectivity, a fully negated object, or a non-object. Heidegger makes this clear. He says, we must never represent the sphere of being and its sphericity as an object. But he also says, he, he asked, must we then present it as a non-object? Uh, and he says, no, we, that would be a mere flight to a manner of speaking. So likewise, Ueda urges us to retain a relation to actuality. He says, uh, when language speaks only in terms of hollowness, there is a danger of rarefying experience. In the one, reality gets overly determined by how it is spoken of. In the other, reality evaporates through language. So this is the main concern of Ueda. Uh, so to speak as such is to be to speak, uh, to uh, play in actuality, uh, is to be poetically indulgent, to assume that the object itself does not make any demands or place any constraints on one's language. So Ueda, I believe, is looking for a middle road between hollowness and actuality, which is similar to Heidegger's desire to go beyond objectivity without losing the object altogether. So Ueda endorses, endorses playing in hollowness while abiding in actuality, yet toying with actuality while abiding on hollowness, on the other hand, is dangerous, because this is the position that asserts the non-object to the complete loss of objectivity and pure, pure hollowness. I'm just reading five minutes. Five minutes? OK. Yes. So although objects uh, are considered empty, they nevertheless have an actual existence that is visible and real, mm. corresponding to what Ueda would call uh, actuality or jitsu no kotoba. If the poet disregards this reality, they evade the dangers of representational language, but they go too far to the other extreme to speak purely from a subjective point of view. And it's precisely here that the danger of poetic indulgence arises. It is here that one can distort the truth without acknowledging any constraints that language places on the, the self. So to speak from the fully non-objective, to toy with actuality, is to speak as though the world places no constraints on our language. So Ueda says that then uh, words can then be used arbitrarily to say just about anything. Particularly in our day and age, the danger of language being taken in this direction seems to be growing due to the central role the media has come to play in contemporary society. The dismantling of reality and the glitzy reconstruction and the sense of hollow embellishment in and through the media is progressing at an accelerated rate. How rampant is the so-called real world of actual society or hollow words spoken as lies? When a balance of actuality and hollowness has not been established as the rule, distinctive difficulties and dangers arise for human existence. <clears throat> so to toy with actuality is to assume that there is no world brought along by objects, no worldly totality that comes to presence with every word. So this is the, re the, excuse me, this is the root of naive ideas of creative freedom. It is not to affirm the world, but to affirm the self. It's a type of freedom tied to the myth of originality and creative genius, which is clearly not part of the poetic language uh, as either Heidegger or Ueda understand it. So now just to finish a short uh, addendum to apply uh, or to look at um, <coughs> the examples that Ueda and, poet, uh, Ueda and Heidegger use uh, to illustrate their theories of poetic language. So to wrap things up, uh, I want to raise an issue uh, I don't have time to properly explore here, uh, but I'd like to make a point. I'd like to point to a slight disparity between the exemplars the two philosophers choose to illustrate their theories of poetic language. So there's an interesting contrast between the poets Heidegger refers to and what his poets for, uh, what our poets for, and other, other works of his, and those Ueda invokes. 
<clears throat> Many of the passages Heidegger chooses from Rilke, Hölderlin, Stefan Georg, and others, while beautifully poetic and beyond reproach as works of art, at the same time, without making any sort of criticism of these poems, poems themselves, I suspect that there's something in their grammatical mood, often an indicative or an imperative mood, that might put it into question, might put their suitability into question as exemplars for Heidegger's own understanding of poetic language. Heidegger delves deeply into several phrases and verses where his poets make quasi or even fully philosophical claims, where they described, or I'm slightly reluctant to say, but maybe even represent the nature of language, of thinking, of the open, where they make existential or even metaphysical assertions. For example, when Heidegger quotes Hölderlin, who writes, full of merit, yet poetically man dwells on this earth, or Stefan Georg, who says, so I renounce and sadly see, where words break off, no things may be. Likewise, Rilke, when speaking of the open, he says our unshieldness, and that when we saw it threat, sorry, uh, our unshieldedness, and that when we saw it threatening, we turned it so into the open. Uh, and another of Rilke's, uh, so into the open that in the widest orbit somewhere where the law touches us, we may affirm it. So again, I want to emphasize that I make no criticism of these poems whatsoever, but possibly in Heidegger's particular use of them, uh, in contrast to Ada, as to Ueda as it pertains to their theories of poetic language. To be more precise, it seems to me that Heidegger focused to a large extent on poems that illustrate his theory of poetic language, whereas with Ueda, his prototype, the young unnamed poet, does not illustrate his theory of poetic language, but we might say actually enacts that theory. The young poet does not attempt to make a philosophical point about language or poetry, nor does the poet, uh, the unnamed poet, attempt to illustrate what hollowness or actuality are. The line Ueda focuses on, uh, just then an orange cloud smoothly passes before our eyes, carrying the day's event, the cloud drifts along, this makes no philosophical claims, but has deep philosophical significance. We can ask then, uh, are Heidegger's poets not veering with their indicative and descriptive idiom in the direction of attempting to represent the world, to have language correspond with reality, rather than a spontaneous saying and a singing from within the open, which is what Heidegger otherwise calls for? If so, it could be that Heidegger's young and humble unnamed poet is the artist we should follow, not simply in understanding or illustrating a theory of poetic language, but from speaking out of the openness and hollowness. So that's it. Thank you. Okay, yes. Time for questions and Lorenzo's course. Thank you so much. Uh, this is a question for both of you. Um, I was surprised. I don't know. I don't know whether much. I know that in Portugal there's a section of Bob Basho. But I was so surprised to, volume is, is fine, I hope. Uh, I, because the words kyo and jitsu are an important part of the uh, aesthetic theory in Basho school. Hmm. Like uh, kyo jitsu ron and the zokugoron and the haikaijuron by Kagami Shiko. And even the example, even the example of the cloud, I mean, he's taking on a name, young poet, hmm. but it's very similar from the, from the examples from the and even the sentence you, you quote in the last one about playing and abiding, mm. I, I, I wonder about the Japanese, but it seems to be literal. Like it's literally taken from Basho school poetics. Mm. So that why he, he's confronting Heidegger and dealing with Rilke, but he has, very clear, has a very clear connection with the conflict theory in uh, well, pre-modern Japanese aesthetics, and like he's, I know there's, I know there's a chapter where he talks about Basho, mm. but does he acknowledge that he, he's in, like he's using these categories and they have exactly the same meaning. They don't come directly from Buddhist, mm. but from this well, Zen influenced uh, aesthetic practice, which has exactly, mm. I mean, the the, the Dokugoron by Shiko is exactly described in this oscillation of dialectic, of white language between hollow and actual or real and unreal. Hmm. Does Weta acknowledge that? Yeah, not that I know of. That's an interesting question. Yeah. I don't know that he does. Uh, I haven't come across him acknowledging it. Um, but the thing 
the thing that I've noticed in this particular work, he in in language in a twofold world, he he plays on on uh, particularly the meaning of uh, kyono kotoba. So he uses it in a way because I think it has um, uh, connotations of um, imaginary or emptiness, void. Um, so early in the essay, he talks about he talks about the the uh, abuses of hollow hollow words, um, and it seems in that case he's playing on the aspect that refers to uh, imaginary, possibly in an abusive sort of way that somebody isn't taking responsibility within the dichotomy of of uh, jitsu no kotaba and kyo no kotaba that that they're sort of uh, engaging in a sort of poetic indulgence. He uses he uses kyo no kotaba in that sense. But then later in the essay, he's actually proposing that the poet has to attune him or herself to this usage. In that sense, he, to me, it seems like he's playing more on the meaning that's associated with emptiness, uh, and because he's talking about the uh, uh, the open as a as a linguistic field of relationality. So, um, so yeah, I don't know about all about about. His, if he makes specific references to Basho or the usage in any of his other works, but I, I haven't encountered it yet. Uh, um, the V are technical terms yeah. in traditional terms. Yeah. And in fact, even the meaning yeah. of the list, uh, even the sentence is really a liberal term. Mm. Yeah, I have the, Japan, the, the sentence of the playing, and so, Jitsu ni ite kyo ni asobu kawari ni. So apologies for my Japanese. Kyo ni itte jitsu o motte asobu koto ni naru. Yes, it's also kokoni because it comes from it's from Kagami Shiko. I don't know. I don't know. I, mean, I, yeah. I want to read the text. Mm -hmm. It's strange if it doesn't quote. I haven't come across it, but I'd be interested to see if I can find it anywhere, <laughs> or if anybody else knows. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I, I want to thank both of you for these very clarifying papers. And I, I, I'm wondering about the respective role of silence mm. in, in Ueda and Heidegger. Now, mm. I know Heidegger has something to say about silence. I don't remember exactly mm -hmm. what it is. Yes. Um, silence plays a crucial role for Ueda. Mm. Uh, silent, the question was asked before, I think, to you, Kiko. Is an urwort uh, a word? Mm. Is a language, or is it not? And it's yes. it, it's uh, between language and silence. And yes. Silence is the font, the source of at least authentic language for Ueda. Yeah. Um, and and that's what differentiates him from most hermeneutical philosophers, mm. who also, of course, recognize the tie between experience and and language. Mm. They miss out on most part on, on silence. So mm. what role in in your in your explanations does uh, silence play? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think there are lots of parallels between Heidegger and uh, Ueda on that issue. So both of them I would say they don't conceive of some strict speech silence dichotomy. So Heidegger's clear that uh, in silence the poet poet does not abdicate the word. So the way that I take Heidegger's type of silence it's not a verbal or a grammatical type of silence. It's the silence of the subject <coughs> as the central sort of enunciative. Uh, so it's a type of it's a type of enunciation that goes beyond. It's sort of being taken by language and allowing yourself as a poet to to speak from within your relation to language. As uh, I suppose for Heidegger, it's an ontological concern. Um, so. Heidegger speaks about silence as a higher higher relation to the word, and so which can include verbalization. So, and Ueda also is clear that so he talks about in in this essay and also on essay about freedom and language, uh, the two essays that he has on freedom and language that um, he focuses on a poem of Rilke's where he has this he has this O. Oh, uh, I might have it here if I can find it, but Yukiko referred to it also, and he talks about this O oh, as also between speech and silence. So he wants us to break through language to silence. 
uh, break back from silence into language, and he conceives of this O oh, exclamation as somehow abiding between language and silence. It's the to say O, oh, and he's talking, I wish I had it here, but... Um, o, o the, pure contradiction. Yes. Uh, desire to be no one's sleep under so many eyelids, something like that. Great, thank you. Uh, yeah, so the way that Ueda thinks of that is that we utter the O oh when we're robbed of language, when some experience manifests in its, uh, its uh, absolute nothingness, and we're taken by that, and at one point, at, or at the same time, I would say, the way that Ueda conceives of it is that, that we're robbed of language, but at the same moment, that's where we come back into language. So he talks about this movement of tearing out of the, the world of language and coming back in. So, so it's like Heidegger, it's not a simple lack of verbalization. It's actually, uh, and the, this is the Urwort, is this O exclamation. So, so I think they, they, they line up quite closely on that. I haven't, I, haven't uh, I, I would like to look into it more to see if there's any uh, senses in which there might be subtle ways that they can be distinguished. But I, By the way, yeah. uh, don't you find that when you criticize Heidegger's use mm. of the poet mm. for perhaps choosing more metaphysical or philosophical statements, but mm -hmm. isn't that what Ueda is doing in, in choosing the epitaph of Rilke? I think when he uses Rilke, yes, yeah. So and he repeats it in a lot of essays. Yeah. The same quote. Yeah, definitely. Everything that I, I said, uh, if my my very undeveloped criticism critique of Heidegger, I would also, uh, I would think that that would apply to Ueda's use of Rilke also. So I think this, this poem specifically, because it's not in the indicative or imperative mood, and also uh, real. Um, Ueda speaks of the fact that uh, um, of a type of uh, poetic utterance that can't be, uh, so the urvor can't be indexed back to the self. It's not the, it's not the utterance of the I or a subject. So the thing that I think saves Ueda and the use of the unnamed child uh, poet is that the unanimity, the, the fact that, or the anonymity, um, is almost an utterance from that position of I am not I. Uh, whereas, yeah, I would say his uses of Rilke I would, would fall, if the criticism is valid at all, I would, I would level it also at that use. Thank you. Any last questions? Just a short question about Heidegger. Um, in your feeling, his thought about art is uh, quite the same, or could you find some differences, maybe slight differences? For example, reading the original work of art and going through the, the essays in Unterwegs zur Sprache, maybe there are some changes. And so uh, I was wondering about the quotation you choose, because maybe sometimes uh, even if in the same quote by Heidegger, we can find some uh, differences sometimes when he made some commentaries on Herderlin poetry, it's not trying to say the same thing when he's trying to make some other commentaries to, to Georgie or to Rilke, for example. Mm. So, that, just a, a glimpse about your yeah, can I ask again the first part about the origin of the work of art? You're, you're also curious what if there's a relation to how he speaks about no, artists? But, um, in my opinion, there is a, a slight shift uh, in, in Heidegger thought uh, yeah. between the, the 30s until the 50s when he is speaking about art. Right. So, just to put it simple, which kind of uh, essay do you choose in order to make this interesting comparison between Heidegger? It was about uh, the, the, the essay of the 50s, it seems to me, about, uh, mm. I don't know, the English translation is uh, pathways mm -hmm. to language. Uh, mm -hmm. on, the way, on the way to language. language. 
Yeah, I think, I think a lot of the ideas, so this is where he talks about also the concept of silence comes up and uh, unspoken. So, um, yeah, I'm not as familiar with those works, but, but I think that, that uh, they're a development of a lot of what, what is, comes out in uh, what are poets for. So, um, and a lot of that, I think, goes, goes along uh, quite well and maybe inspired some of Ueda's works on poetic language. Um, so, so yeah, I don't know if I've got much more to, to say on that because, um, yeah, I'm not as familiar with those, with those works, but, but I think they're generally in line with the, the ideas. Uh, the in the collection, you know, there is also the famous dialogue with the Japanese. Yeah. And sometimes uh, it's a real right. kind of a creation of uh, what he taught to Japanese. Yeah. Even if it's based on, on some basis, some real basis of yeah. his dialogues. But uh, sometimes you, you feel that Haruo is building up his own idea about what Japanese language is. And, and yeah. maybe some of his ideas about poetry are also stand up from that real uh, understanding of his own about what Japanese language is and mm. what poetry should do. Mm. Yeah, I think that would be very problematic to introduce his ideas from the dialogue with Japanese uh, into this particular comparison because he ultimately thinks that these are two irreconcilable houses of being that can't necessarily speak to each other. Um, but it's interesting. I haven't thought of that, but I think there, there's, there, there could be something to explore there between that his depiction of language uh, in that particular uh, work, and then the the how he develops his theories of of uh, language and the in in um, on the way to language and uh, and his later ideas of of th thinking or thought could also be brought in. But but yeah, I'd be interested to hear more what you have to say. I'm not as familiar with those works, but thank you for the question. Six o'clock. <laughs> so we have to leave it now here. And thank you again.